coffee actually helps fat cells. It stimulates lipolysis. It causes fat cells to shoot out some some calories. Not everybody can tolerate uh, time-restricted eating, and not everybody needs to. Carbohydrates raise insulin and suppress glucagon. That's That's the worst possible combination. Typically, when people think of obesity, they think of somebody who has a lack of willpower, somebody that's over-consuming, under-moving their body. You have a new paradigm shift here when it comes to people that are overweight and obese. The fact that they're actually starving their body. So we'll start off there. Sure. Well, the usual way of thinking about obesity is, uh, according to the notion, calories in, calories out, that we in our modern food environment, consume too many calories. There are all these tasty, energy-dense foods around. And in our sedentary lifestyle, we don't burn off those calories. So they build up in our bloodstream. They get forced into fat cells. The fat cells grow. We gain weight and ultimately develop obesity. This view considers all calories are alike to the body. Uh, It doesn't matter whether it's um, cheesecake or cherries. 100 calories or 100 calories. So since all calories are alike, the only way to lose weight by this view is to eat fewer of them or burn more off with physical activity. It, it sort of makes sense because you know we know that we can cut back calories and lose weight for a while, but that's the rub. Whereas most people can lose weight for a few days or a few weeks or very disciplined people for a few months, very few people can do so afterward. And that isn't just a question of discipline or willpower. It's not just behavior. It's also biology. We know that with weight loss, the body fights back in predictable ways. One is with rising hunger. And you know, look around us. Few people can ignore hunger just driving in the car. We have our cars situated so that we can keep drinks and food and all that. You know, so you're, according to the conventional approach, you have to ignore your hunger, not just for a day or a week or a month, but permanently. And even if you could, uh, the body fights back in other ways, most notably with slowing metabolic rate. So um, rather than think of obesity as a sort of a behavioral issue that we have to control our energy balance, The carbohydrate insulin model says we've reversed cause and effect, that overeating doesn't make us fat. It's the process of getting fat that makes us overeat. Now, that might sound a little surprising, but think about the adolescent growth spurt. You know, in a teenage years, a boy or a girl might be consuming hundreds or thousands of excess calories, and they're growing really rapidly. But which comes first? Does the overeating make the adolescent grow? Or does the rapid growth with deposition of those calories into new body tissue make the adolescent hungry and eat more? So according to the carbohydrate insulin model, that's happening with our fat cells. The fat cells are being triggered to take in too many calories. They're too few for the body. And unless we address that problem, it's going to be a battle between mind and metabolism most people will lose. Well, let's get into the nuances and continue the story here. So fat cells are taking in too many calories. What happens physiology-wise? What what gets triggered in the body when that happens? Well, when we eat, um, calories flood in, more than we need for our metabolism at the moment, and some of it gets stored. And we know that this is just basic new, um, physiology 101. Um, so after a big meal, some of those calories wind up being stored in liver, some of it gets stored in muscle, and importantly, Um, calories get stored in fat. Then when we're not eating, so after the stomach has emptied from the uh, calories have been absorbed from the ones we've eaten at the meal, we have to shift from storing calories to pulling calories out of storage to keep our blood sugar and the calories in our blood from crashing. Of course, the brain needs calories 24-7. If we run out of calories for a moment, we would lose consciousness. So The problem is that with the fast digesting carbohydrates that have flooded our diet, especially since the low-fat diet era of the late 20th century, these rapidly digesting carbohydrates, they what are we talking about? White bread, white rice, potato products, sugary 
breakfast cereals, sugary drinks, uh, these you know, low fat snack foods, they turn into sugar after eating literally within minutes. You know, eat them, and minutes later, and you can see this if you have a continuous blood glucose monitor, blood sugar is surging up. And that makes more of the hormone insulin be secreted than would be the case with any other food. Um, I call insulin the miracle grow for your fat cells, just not the sort of miracle you want happening in your body. What that insulin does is program a few extra calories to get sucked up into fat cells. And then when you need those calories, three, four, five hours after the meal and fasting, that insulin, the prolonged effects restrain those calories from getting out of the fat cells. And all you need is a little shift. So a typical person who's developing obesity might be lean in high school, develops obesity by middle age. That's kind of the typical development of obesity. That's the storage of 10 calories extra a day. That's less than one teaspoon of sugar and calories. So a subtle shift day in, day out could make all the difference. And so uh, the carbohydrate insulin model says that unless we consider calories based on their metabolic effects, that all calories are alike, unless we consider how those calories are affecting our hormones and metabolism, uh, we're going to have a tough road to hoe. So what I think I hear you saying here is the fact that when we have meals that are higher in carbohydrates, we're going to spike blood glucose, which is going to spike insulin. Insulin is going to drive that glucose into the fat cells. So that's going to be problem one when it comes to obesity. And the second part I heard you talk about there was the fact that when insulin's in the blood, and this is even after a couple few hours, because of the higher carbohydrates, that's not going to allow fat cells to release calories into the body and burn those calories. Do I have that right? That's right. You know, we have um, potent, many potent hormones whose whole job is to regulate the calories in the blood. In addition to insulin, there's glucagon. That's a hormone that's made right next to insulin. And it's very important. It's actually the opposite of insulin. It's insulin's antidote. People with type 1 diabetes, if they take too much insulin, they literally take glucagon as a rescue because glucagon helps pull calories out of storage. So we want to get the right balance between insulin and glucagon. There are many other hormones as well, adrenaline, growth hormone, and a new, uh, newly recognized exciting class of hormones called the incretins, like GLP-1, upon which some of these new weight loss drugs are based. But all of these hormones are ultimately there to fine tune the foods that we eat and that we've evolved to eat, which we eat in an episodic way, right? We, we're not eating every hour. We eat a few times a day and we need to distribute those calories throughout the day because our metabolism is continuous. Our meals are episodic our metabolism is continuous. So all these hormones are there designed to smooth out that process. Uh, so you can fill up the tank you know, with the meal and then it gets nicely burned. But these modern processed foods, but it's not just all processed foods, and we can maybe drill down on this more. It's the processed carbohydrates. You know, processing fat doesn't change the digestion rate. An olive and olive oil digest slowly even though that olive oil is still highly processed. Um, you know, uh, a, a boiled egg and a scrambled egg digest pretty much the same. It's the processed carbohydrates. Once you take like a whole kernel wheat grain, uh, like a wheat berry, and you mill that into a fine flour, or once you take a fruit and you suck out the, the sugars, then it digests very quickly. So you can think of this as naked carbohydrates. And these naked carbohydrates are the problem from a metabolic perspective. Okay, well, let's get really practical here. So we have the overview of what happens with the glucose, the insulin, and why the way we're eating these days typically is a problem. But let's get go, let's go really granular right now into the solution and what somebody would want to eat and how somebody would want to eat to work with those hormones instead of against them. Right. Well, um, so starting with the observation that our 
metabolism is is continuous. You need to be, you know, it goes up when we're physically active, it goes down a bit when we're sleeping, but basically it's running. You know, we've got an idle of the motor, it's going continuously. So we'd like to, to so the easiest on the system is to eat in a way in which the food, the calories from the food are digested slowly. So they don't overwhelm the bloodstream and make massive surges in hormones and then lead to this crash later. So a diet that conceptually has, you can have carbohydrates, but those carbohydrates need to be minimally processed in a, an intact structure. So again, it's like wheat berries or steel cut oats, um, whole, tro- especially the tropical fruits, more so than things like grapes or, or more, th- more so than things like watermelon or banana. Um, so the, the whole minimally processed carbohydrates, especially with uh, a good amount of fat and protein, is a package which when we eat, digests slowly. And in addition, the protein and fat slow down gastric emptying. You know, your grandmother probably used the expression, might have used the expression, you know, the food sticks to your ribs. You know, that you know, that encapsulates what's actually happening. That food stays in your stomach longer. And when it gets into the intestines to be digested, it takes longer for the body to extract out the calories from the food. The food makes it down further into the digestive tract where it provokes satiety hormones like this incretin GLP, which has many beneficial effects. And so that's a way of eating that um, makes it from this perspective, much easier to control hunger and body weight and maintain metabolism. The other extreme of that would be like a sugary beverage or um, a typical breakfast recommended during the low fat diet era, which like uh, bagel, fat-free cream cheese and orange juice. You know, that's from this perspective, a hormonal nightmare. It's going to digest very quickly, leading to the surge of blood sugar and insulin. The calories are going to get stored away and then a few hours later, when you need the calories, they're not going to be as, as available. You're going to get hungry. And if you resist the hunger, your body is going to fight back by slowing metabolism. Let's talk about that period of time. We've touched on the fact that insulin impacts the body even hours after a meal when there's a meal high in carbs. How long does that impact? I'm sure it varies depending on what the meal is. But in a really general sense, let's get an idea of what that timeline looks like and how it impacts the body. Right. Well, some of these hormones, like insulin, has a very short half-life. It just lasts for a few minutes. But the prolonged biological actions of insulin uh, remain around for many hours. In fact, there's something called a second meal effect that's been known for a half a century which is that the type of foods you eat, for example, at dinner, you know, if you eat slower digesting carbohydrates, um, will affect your, your glucose tolerance, you know, how your body handles sugar the next morning. So that's 12, 14 hours effects. So, um, on the other hand, you know, we're not talking one meal, like one bad meal doesn't doom you to metabolic hell for weeks, you know, you can begin to shift your metabolism right away. And metabolism is very forgiving in that sense. With one healthful meal, you can, you know, you can see changes in hormonal patterns happening already. But ultimately, when we shift diet, um, it takes a few weeks to adapt to it, especially when you're going from a high carbohydrate diet, which most people are habitually consumed, to a lower carb diet with more fat. You need to upregulate pathways in the body that burn fat and that and ultimately on a very low carbohydrate diet which most people don't need to consume but if uh, you have metabolic more severe metabolic disorders like diabetes that could be helpful um, on a ketogenic diet with very little carbohydrate you know it takes a while for the body to generate these ketones ketones are great molecules they're great fuels the brain loves it um, ketogenic diets have been used as almost miracle cures at times for childhood epilepsy. The brain really likes ketones. It's got a lot of benefits, but it takes a few weeks, which is why we also need to be skeptical of these short diet trials, the ones that are 
two weeks or less, because they're really looking at how, how the body adapts to a new diet, but the but it doesn't tell us anything about the long term effects. So um, there's just a bit of science methodology when you see a short term diet study, like two weeks or less. Um, maybe be skeptical of the results and say that you're going to wait for, you know, longer, better studies. Yeah. A couple, that point you just made is really important. I want to go there for two reasons. One, like you said, if somebody's looking at the science and it's contradicting what we're talking about here, you got to look at the study length. And then a lot of people that are tuning in today are probably having a diet that has more moderate or higher carbohydrates and maybe they've been on this kind of diet for, you know, 40, 50 years or longer, who knows. But what I'm getting at here is because you've talked about that period of time where it takes a few weeks for the body and the physiology to adapt. I think it's important that people understand that right out of the get go, because they need to be patient and realize this takes time. And if things are uncomfortable in the beginning or their body suggesting that they need to be aware so they can push through. And as I use that word push through, how can people get through that first few weeks when they're adapting to this lower carbohydrate diet? What can they expect with their body and how can they get through that transition in a less intense way? Yeah, well, let's just uh, break this up into um, categories. So for somebody who's eating a sort of a, what they call a, an SAD, a standard American diet, lots of processed carbs. We get, typical American gets about 40% of their calories from various kinds of processed starches and sugars. So simply shifting those to less processed versions, so like going from instant oatmeal to steel cut oats, old fashioned oatmeal, um, white bread to the kind of German breads that you might see or Scandinavian breads where you can see the whole kernel. Actually, I think they're much tastier and they've got a little tooth to them. You know, you chew them a little. Um, but if you make these kinds of changes, you're not making major changes in the amount of carbohydrates. That um, is not going to, you know, you might have a little bit of you know, a sense of sugar withdrawal for a few days, but that's, you know, that may be psychological as much as biological. But what we're talking about is when you cut way back on the carbs, you know, so if you're eating 50 or 60% of carbs and you drop it in half to like 30%, 30% still leaves room for maybe one serving of grains a day, a few servings of fruit, some beans, plenty of vegetables. So it's not a restrictive diet, but that is a big change. And that can, you know, that can lead to mild symptoms um, over a week or so. And then the third stage is if you're really going to a low carb diet, a ketogenic diet, where you're going below 10%, which um, we're talking about eliminating all grains and potatoes, maybe having one serving of berries a day, you know, a lower sugar fruit, um, but getting most of your calories from fat, various kinds of fat, protein. And of course, you can have lots of non-starchy vegetables that way. But this is this ketogenic diet that does take um, several weeks to adapt. People can have intense symptoms initially because you cut off carbohydrate, which is what the brain is used to feeding on. But the alternative fuel, um, ketones, hasn't reached uh, you know, therapeutic levels yet. That takes two or three weeks. And so during that transition time, people feel tired. They might feel some food cravings. Um, it's, there's ways of minimizing that. Uh, one thing that is important is to get enough salt um, because you lose salt. And that's actually a benefit for people with high blood pressure. When you lower insulin, the body gets rid of salt, but you don't want to get dehydrated. So if you're doing, the bottom line is if you're, do, if you're doing anything less than a ketogenic diet, they're going to be relatively mild symptoms. If you're doing a ketogenic diet, get some professional guidance so that you don't you know, have any unnecessary side effects or rarely get into trouble from making, uh, making the wrong food choices. So now we know there's this continuum from the SAD or SAD diet to ketogenic. How does somebody decide where to jump in when they want to take your advice, start losing weight? 
how do they know where is best for them? Should they just start eliminating the processed carbs? Should they go all the way to ketogenic? Does it just depend on the person and their goals or where they're at to start? How does that work? The first thing to recognize is that one size doesn't fit all. There are many differences between people based in part on genetics, based on how they their insulin is secreted, um, maybe based on other, earlier life influences, stress or deprivation during the perinatal period. Like if a, um, a child is born um, uh, having with a mother having smoked or with maybe small for gestational age, that can have prolonged effects on metabolism. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying that everybody uh, will benefit from carbohydrate reduction in the same way. I don't think anybody uh, will be harmed by reducing the processed carbohydrates um, and substituting them for less processed carbohydrates. Even people who are lean, uh, we know that there are many people who can be lean and still at risk for diabetes um, or cardiovascular disease. Or increasingly, we're seeing neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's. And these are importantly influenced by insulin resistance. That's in fact, Alzheimer's has been called type 3 diabetes, uh, insulin resistance in the brain. A very good way to reduce insulin resistance is by cutting back on the processed carbs and replacing them with either slower digesting carbohydrates or you know, healthy fats. So one size doesn't fit all, but I think for somebody who has a weight problem, a logical place to start could be uh, just that first step. Replace the processed carbs with um, whole. So let's let's be practical. Let's say take one serving of refined grains, one serving of a potato product, and one serving of sugar. Let's say let's say you're having six of those all together. Take half of them, so one of each. Uh, knock those off, but don't just eliminate them. You'll be hungry. So replace them with uh, maybe a serving of fruit, whole fruit, uh, a serving of healthful fats like nuts or uh, full fat dairy, um, and maybe a serve a little more olive oil or a rich uh, sauce or spread, and uh, see how that goes. I mean, for some for some people that may be enough shift to prevent that inexorable pound or two of weight gain that happens for most people. Um, some people will need a more, you know, we could benefit from more intensive carbohydrate restriction. But even when you get down to even as down as low as like 20 or 5 or 30 percent, that's still a normal diet. I mean, it's still a diet that um, you can eat, you can go out to dinner, you know, it's not going to affect your social life, but it's a more significant change. And then again, for people with severe metabolic issues, type 2 diabetes and the like, um, there's growing evidence that a, a very low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet can be especially attractive. You quickly touched on the fact that insulin responds differently person to person. Let's get into the nuances of what impacts that and how that is going to be reflected in the person's health and well-being. Well, uh, maybe to get a little bit technical, um, we do something in our research studies called an insulin 30. So that's um, most people, most of your followers, or viewers will be familiar with an oral glucose tolerance test. Many women will have had that during their pregnancy, a version of that. And usually they follow blood sugar. They give you sugar and they follow blood sugar. But you can also look at what happens to insulin. And the key from our perspective is what happens to insulin early after the glucose is conserved at 30 minutes. The people who secrete a lot of insulin at 30 minutes, we call them high insulin secretors, they seem to be uh, strongly predisposed to weight gain on a high-carb diet. And we've seen this many times. Uh, we actually have seen it in rodents. So the same thing happens in rats in the laboratory. The high insulin secreting rats gain more weight on a uh, processed carb diet on a, what's called a high glycemic index diet than the low insulin secretors. Um, and we also know that drugs that, drug, drugs that block insulin secretion promote weight loss. Drugs that increase insulin secretion, for the most part, cause weight gain. And um, so that's not a test that you necessarily can 
just get. Um, it's more of a research tool. But what we have found is that the people who are high insulin secretors look a little different. Their body shape is different. They tend to sh store more of their fat around the midsection. So if you look more like an apple than a pear, uh, you are more likely to be a high insulin secretor and might do especially well. You know, you you might you might be the person who cut back on fat during the late '90s as you were told to, and you gained weight even more rapidly. So for you, a low carb diet might be especially helpful. And an example that really hits home what you're talking about here is a type one diabetic where they're not producing much insulin. And I've heard you talk about the fact they can consume enormous amounts of calories and not put on weight. Right. So in type one diabetes, so that's the type that traditionally strikes uh, children, um, although it can hit um, adults too. And if you get it in childhood, you'll have it for the rest of your life. Um, it's an autoimmune condition in which the insulin producing cells in the pancreas are destroyed. So you absolutely you need insulin to stay alive. So, but the amount of insulin you need is going to be much different based on your, if you're eating a lot of carbohydrate or little carbohydrate. And um, there's a lot of, there, there are advantages to eating a diet that doesn't require as much insulin because when you're using less insulin, the risk of hypoglycemia, you know, we're worried about blood sugar being too high in diabetes, but also too low. The risk of hypoglycemia is reduced and it it's easier to control the blood sugar after the meal. And re with regard to your question, so if a child comes in with new onset diabetes, I'm a pediatric endocrinologist in Boston. I've seen, you know, through my career, hundreds of children like this. Um, characteristically, they have the three Ps, polyuria, polydipsia, and polyphagia. It's fancy saying they're really thirsty, so they're drinking a lot, peeing a lot. That's diabetes means peeing a lot. And polyphagia means they're really hungry. They're eating a huge amount, sometimes a thousand or more calories than they used to, and yet they're losing weight. So even with that massive overeating, those calories can't get stored unless there's insulin. And that is, uh, th this is endocrinology 101, but yet it's not commonly appreciated when we think about how diet affects hormone levels. Well, I think it's just important to highlight that example because it really does hammer home the fact that what we've been talking about to this point where carbohydrates cause blood glucose to spike, which causes insulin to rise, and that's going to drive calories into the fat cells. So at the root of all of this is insulin. Yeah, insulin and glucagon, it's, it's partner, um, kind of yin and yang. Um, carbohydrates raise insulin and suppress glucagon. That's, that's the worst possible combination. Proteins, some people will you know, challenge this way of thinking by saying, well, protein causes some insulin secretion, and that's true. Um, not as much, you know, you can eat a chicken breast and uh, you'll make some insulin, not as much as you would after eating the same number of calories as white bread. Um, but what protein does is also increase rather than suppress glucagon. So you have a, a balance between the hormone that drives calories in but also the hormone that pulls calories out rather than uh, an extreme imbalance of both in the, in the wrong direction. How does fructose fit into this whole thing? We talked about whole fruit earlier. That's metabolized in the body totally different than typical carbohydrates. So let's get into the nuances there and how you go about working with that with people. Yeah, most carbohydrates break down into um, either glucose. So Glucose, all the starches, breads, potatoes, all the starches that we would eat are glucose in a long chain. And if that's highly processed, then in most situations, um, it breaks down in minutes. In fact, just you can try this at home. Um, take a, a bite of typical like white wonder white bread. Chew it really well. Keep it in your mouth. Mix it with saliva. And you notice a change to the taste. 
Does it start getting a little sweet? Have you noticed that? That's sugar from the starch popping off the, 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 the starch backbone under the weak effects of saliva enzymes. Once that starch hits the powerful enzymes lower down, it just melts into glucose. And that glucose raises itself. Now, another sugar is fructose. And fructose is really only present in fruit. A um, little bit in beans and a few other places. But mainly it's fruit. Um, fructose doesn't raise insulin, but it kind of... So insulin, we're talking about glucose, raises insulin and takes a hit on the fat cells. Too much fructose um, doesn't raise insulin, but takes a hit on the liver. It kind of drives the liver to do um, unhealthy things, like something called de novo lipogenesis. That means making fat from carbohydrate, and it can be inflammatory. The thing is, it's not the total amount of fructose you eat. People can eat a whole lot of whole fruits and be really metabolically healthy. There are all sorts of populations around the world. You know, if fructose was the dominant toxin. Um, then people eating six, eight servings of fruit a day should really be showing problems. But in fact, in the United States, in the in the, the cohort studies, the more fruit people eat, the healthier they tend to be. Now, some of that could be confounding because fruit eaters are also maybe have other healthful benefits. But if fruit were the big problem, if fructose were the big problem, it should overwhelm all of the other healthy behaviors. So it's really the rate at which the fructose hits the body and hits the liver. So whereas whole fruit takes a while for the digestive tract to suck out those sugars and then absorb them, uh, the sugars, the fructose and sugar, added sugar, or the worst possible one is sugary beverages, slam right in. And that, even in moderate amounts, could be a real problem. Um, and, and sugar, table sugar, the type, type that you, you know, most, most sugars that we would eat are some version of half fructose, half glucose. So you actually get kind of, you, you get hit both ways. And so um, step one is to have your sugars in the natural form, slowly digested whole fruits, or um, for people who are insulin resistant, maybe cut down on the total carbs as well. Early in our conversation, we made it clear the fact that traditional thinking of losing weight by counting calories and lessening those and moving more is is a recipe for a disaster. But how do you feel about intermittent fasting where people aren't necessarily having less calories in a 24-hour period, but they're having them within a more narrow window? Is that something you advocate right. for? Or okay. you, so how do you just, feel about that? Let's just step back for a sec. So why is calorie restriction not a great idea overall. Well, if the calories based on the hormonal effects of food you're eating, it's like a turnstile. If they're being shunted a little bit more into fat, then there are fewer calories available for your muscle, your brain, and your your brain is going to respond by saying, I'm hungry, feed me. And if you don't feed it, if you don't eat, if you resist your brain, then the brain is going to say, well, I've got to protect you. So I'm going to slow down the tables. So um, that's why that's a hard road to go. And we know this. I mean, very few people, most people really don't want to be heavy if they have a weight problem in the United States. You know, I mean, it's, you know, they've been lectured about the unhealthful aspects. There's a lot of stigma. You know, cutting back 500 calories a day should solve the problem for most people. 500 calories isn't that much. You know, it's, you know, maybe a, a quarter of the total calorie consumption, or for some people less. Why is that so difficult? Um, because it's not just cutting, it's not a behavioral thing. The body starts fighting back. And so that's why we have to think about weight control at the fat cell and metabolism rather than a calorie restriction. Now, could there be ways of combining both models? And yes, an intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating might be one way. So in that situation, I suggest, so time-restricted eating, which I practice um, during the weekdays. So what I do is I just have coffee for breakfast. Um, coffee actually helps fat cells. It stimulates lipolysis. It causes fat cells to shoot out some 
some calories. And so when that happens, that's why, ca- you know, caffeine uh, was a weight loss drug. It was used. It's not very powerful, but it helps you fast. So there's less hunger. And then I have a low carb meal at lunch, and then I have just whatever I want to eat at dinner. And I spend, you know, a good part of my day probably with ketones. And I have no hunger this way. But don't try this on a conventional low, on a conventional high carb diet. If you're eating a high carb diet and making a lot of insulin, your fat cells are going to be programmed more towards storage. So when you stop eating and you try to fast, you're going to be fighting your metabolism harder. You know, at a time when you need, when you're fasting, you need those fat cells to be releasing calories and they're going to be holding on. And that is going to be tough. So start it by adapting your body to a higher fat, low carb diet. doesn't have to be extreme, but just move the processed carbohydrates away. And then you could start by moving your breakfast up by an hour uh, every couple of days. You know, start, if you have breakfast at seven, start, try eight or nine and then try 10. And then at some point, maybe try skipping breakfast and just having your first meal as lunch. Uh, And again, if you drink coffee or tea, if you can do that, that's a really good way to make this process easy. So you got into the coffee tea there, touched on it a couple times, got me thinking about other substances or supplements that people could consume either during the fasting window or the regular window to help with weight loss. Are there any others we can add to that list? Uh, there are all sorts of drugs that can affect appetite, but you know, the, uh, any kind of drug you would take is going to have a side effect. Um, although perhaps I guess you could consider a caffeine pill a drug. I mean, coffee is, a, is from one perspective a drug too. Um, so if you can't drink coffee, but you know you can do an equivalent amount of caffeine pills, um, that's probably okay anything stronger is going to start having side effects and might not be needed. I think that, um, you know, many people, not everybody can tolerate uh, time-restricted eating and not everybody needs to. Um, I found that as I, you know, get further into middle age and metabolism shifts, and we could talk about why that happens, that this change has really helped, you know, me to maintain, even during the pandemic, um, to avoid weight gain. And it, the other advantage is you get to eat a really nice big dinner since you're not getting your calories in the morning. And mornings, you just sort of sit around and have a cup of coffee um, uh, on the veranda if you have a nice view or talking to your partner or whatever. Um, so it, it kind of makes for a nice smooth morning too. What I was getting at though is fasting mimicking foods, other foods or supplements we can have. Caffeine was was a good example there for people during that fasting period. But are there other things people can do to accentuate fat loss while they're fasting in the morning? Um, well, you know, fat itself is pretty close, metabolically is pretty close to fasting. Fat doesn't raise and he doesn't change hormones very much. So this is the, the, the notion of the bulletproof coffee that some of your viewers might have tried. You, you take coffee. So you've got all of the things we just discussed, you know, the caffeine. Um, and the bitterness also, you know, can be a little satiating of, of coffee. Um, and then you add to it butter and... Um, MCT oil. Uh, versions of... Yeah, versions of coconut oil, so medium chain triglycerides. And you blend it all up, you make it a little emulsion there, and you drink it, and then you get uh, very intense satiety. Um, And so that can kind of act in a way like it drives ketones way up um, quickly. Uh, And it kind of acts like fasting to the body. But, um, you know, many people don't need that because you are dumping in hundreds of extra calories. So if you can go in the morning without needing those calories, um, then you're, you know, you're able to, um, you know, coax more calories out of your fat cells, again, in conjunction with a diet that's lowering insulin and allowing those calories to come out. Um, and then, um, 
The last thing would be exercise. So when you get really adapted, when your metabolism gets very flexible, you can not only skip breakfast, but you can exercise fasting. And um, uh, I, I love to do that. Uh, you know, um, have coffee, you know, do a little work in the morning, and then before lunch, work out, still fasting. That is really driving you into a, a high ketone catabolic state and um you know that's going to really lower your insulin resistance and potentially help with inflammation but that's the, we're talking advanced practices and i think for for most people just starting with the processed carbs is going to get them quite a ways along one of the things i really liked about your book and this is a less advanced thing than some of the stuff you're getting into there is just going for a walk after dinner so this can help with blood glucose and then help with insulin by just, you know, if you have a partner or a family or friend, like somebody you go for a walk with after yeah. dinner, this can be a great practice for a number of reasons, including its impact on blood glucose and insulin. Right. Yeah. We call that the passaggiata. Um, it's an Italian term for the walk after dinner, but you know, you can, you know, de-stress, lowering stress is going to help metabolism. And just light physical activity, you know, in distinction from really pushing it with the morning fast and the workout, just light physical activity is going to help glucose metabolism, help keep insulin after the meal a little bit lower. Um, and, you know, you can just enjoy that last part of um, last part of the day. We've talked a lot about the calories in, calories out, uh, people counting calories and then trying to move more. The second half of that is the movement piece, which is what we're getting into now, but more the nuanced pieces of that walking after dinner or having a fasted workout. Let's talk about the second half of that equation that's used in a more classic sense when people are trying to lose weight and why that isn't a good thing when it comes to weight loss. Uh, um, are you asking why doesn't um, exercise as part of a calorie restricted diet help? Yeah, like we've we've focused to this point, except for more recently in the conversation, but that was more nuanced examples on the calorie piece. But there's also this exercise piece that's, okay. you know, your classic conventional wisdom is to recommend moving more and exercising, burning calories that way to lose weight. But talk about why that's okay. Well, a recipe for disaster again. Yeah, so um, let's refer to a, a study that we did some years ago. Um, with rodents um, that, and there's reason to believe that the same thing happens to some degree in humans. So we gave um, both rats and mice the same protein and fat and carbohydrate, but one was fast digesting. So high glycemic index, raise the insulin. And the other was slow digesting. Everything else was the same. And um, we um, also fed them in a way that kept their weight the same over what would be the equivalent of two or three rat years, you know, it was like 18 weeks. And we saw some interesting things. Um, insulin went up in that fast digesting carb group as we expected. Um, and then that group's metabolism started slowing. Um, in a line of experiments that we did uh, uh, with a different group of animals, they became more sedentary spontaneously eating the processed carbs, they spontaneously became more sedentary. Their fat started expanding. And since we kept their weight the same and the fat expanded, it had to come at the expense of their lean mass, their muscle. So they had they were cannibalizing their muscle um, because their fat was growing. The fat was growing. There wasn't enough calories for the brain. So they were grabbing calories from the muscle. So if your fat cells are on storage overdrive, um, the last thing you're going to want to do is work out, right? Because your brain's going to be telling you, slow down, conserve, eat, and conserve the calories. And especially if you're cutting back on calories at the same time, workouts are going to be much harder. Um, you're going to be more inclined to collapse on the couch than to get onto the Stairmaster, which is why we, you know, an explanation for why Exercise is a very poor prescription for weight loss. This has been looked at time and time again. 
you know, people may benefit from exercise in various ways. Uh, some of their heart risk factors may improve. They may feel better. And if you feel better, you might be motivated to make other changes in your nutrition. But people don't lose any substantial amount of weight because the body compensates. You know, you don't want, you're setting up this battle between mind and metabolism. And you start with the diet first, especially in a way that shifts what we call substrate partitioning, where those calories wind up. Then the exercise potentially become synergistic. Um, you'll have more calories around for muscle, which will fuel your physical activity. Earlier, you touched on the fact that as we age, our metabolism is going to change when you're referring, I think, to something with you, the way you've changed your routine over the years. Talk about when that happens and what happens in the body. Yeah, well, it's not clear exactly when it would happen at what age is going to differ variously for people um, based on their overall health. Um, their sex might have something to do with it, whether you're a man or a woman. But a lot of people notice, like in there, you know, when they cross the the big F, the big four O, um, that things shift. You know, that they're finding it harder to keep the weight off. Some of that could be for women, hormonal changes with menopause. Um, but another thing that happens is, and it's not commonly rec recognized, that um, the brain controls fat cells. You know, fat cells don't do anything on their own. They do a lot of major things, but they're instructed to do so. Insulin instructs them to store calories. There are other hormones that instruct them to pull out calories. But the brain is a major, it has major continuous communication with fat cells through something called the autonomic nervous system. And that's specifically the part of that called the sympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system is involved in excitation and adrenaline response, norepi, nor, norepi and things like that. But there are nerves that go right from primitive parts of the brain right down into fat cells. And the sympathetic tone, the amount of sympathetic stimulation coming from the brain drives lipolysis. It drives the fat cells to release calories. Uh, I think as people age, the sympathetic tone to fat cells declines. And so the balance between taking in calories and putting out calories in fat cells starts to shift subtly, making it a little harder to maintain your weight. But there are ways to compensate for that, as we've been discussing. Is there ways to specifically impact the brain in the sympathetic tone? Well, uh, some of the classic weight loss drugs, you know, are stimulants. Um, we go go right back to amphetamine. You know, that was a great weight loss drug. It works extremely well. Uh, it also has extreme side effects, including sudden death. Um, but that was, you know, amphetamines were recommended to people, especially women, for weight loss, like back in the fifties and such. Um, and um, so caffeine is a stimulant, but much less dangerous. We know that, you know, in fact, uh, up to a point, the more coffee people drink, the healthier they tend to be. Isn't that great? Like, you know, people drinking five cups of coffee a day, and it varies a little bit about, you know, some people can't tolerate it. And there's different genetic makeups. But, you know, up to about five cups of coffee a day, we see a stepwise decrease in the risk for type 2 diabetes. and um, other health benefits. So it's a very safe drug. And um, it, uh, it specifically stimulates fat cells to release calories. It's lipolytic. Um, coffee was used in the Middle Ages by monks, especially, uh, to help them with religious fasting. You know, they loved coffee for that purpose. Um, and so I think that's you know, that's a, a, a supplement that is on the safe side as opposed to some of the other drugs that uh, have been used um, or could be used that aren't. Got it. Comes back to the coffee again. Coffee. When you talk about the sympathetic nervous system, it gets me thinking about stress. And I know this is a factor when it comes to weight loss as well. Somebody, if they're dealing with chronic stress in their lives and they're not managing that in a healthy way, 
Let's bring that into the equation now and talk about that. Okay, well, there's two hormonal arms to the stress response. And one was the ones we've just been talking about, the quick ones, like uh, epinephrine and adrenaline. If uh, you inject, if somebody gets an asthmatic attack, you know, they can't breathe, you inject epinephrine, minutes later, within a minute, they're experiencing relief very fast. Um, there's another arm to the stress response involves steroids or things like cortisol. Um, and that takes longer. That takes hours um, to have fuller effects. And over days and weeks, chronic stress um, build up. And that's really, that's bad. Um, that kind of strong chronic stress drives fat deposition. Um, it's not the kind of stress that pulls the calories out of, it's not the stimulation that it pushes calories in. You know, so a side effect of prednisone, which people take for asthma, for chronic asthma, is weight gain and lots of other side effects. It lowers, it dissolves, it, it, it takes a toll on lean mass, it, it can um, deteriorate bone quality and affects the brain and so forth. And then stress, um, either through those hormones or, or other mechanisms, just affects our brain and affects our ability to make good judgments and um, about what we eat, about our physical activity. So, yeah, stress is important. What about sleep? I want us to hit on a lot of these other factors that complement food, which is yeah. the big one we're talking about today. How does that fit into all this? Right. Well, these are, you know, in our program, the Always Hungry book program, we we target all of these for a reason. And um, sleep is part of it. And, you know, it, it, uh, I think it makes more sense to think of sleep altering obesity risk through the carbohydrate insulin model mechanism we're talking about. It's not like when people are, uh, the other way of thinking about it is that when people are sleep deprived, um, they just make bad choices and they're tempted to eat unhealthy things. Okay. So maybe that's true. Although if you're sleep deprived, when you're not sleeping, you're actually burning off more calories, right? You know, if you're up, you know, whatever you're doing, instead of sleeping, you're probably moving more than you would, your metabolic rate would be higher. So it should in some ways go in the other direction. Whereas from this perspective, sleep and stress are altering um, fat cell behavior, causing the fat cells to shift in their you know, take uptake of calories. And that's what's driving everything else. And so certainly, yeah, we, we, we recommend a good night's sleep. And that can also get a little harder as you get older. A lot of people as they age have more um, interrupted sleep patterns. Um, and some people can have a pattern called segmented sleep, which is normal, but you have to adapt to it. It means like you go to bed, you know, if you go to bed at 10, you might wake up at one. And then you're up for an hour or two. Um, and then you go back to sleep and you sleep the rest of the night. And there's ways of managing that and, you know, not getting too upset. And, um, but, uh, yeah, if, for people who have trouble sleeping, especially as they get older, um, you know, there, there, there are programs, there's professional assistance for uh, sleep hygiene. We have some recommendations in our book, but um, sometimes that we, you know, that really needs to be a major focus. Up until this point, we've been talking about how to lose weight and why the classical way we've been trying hasn't been working. But let's get into the nuances of why losing weight's important. I think a lot of people get into this because of the aesthetic. They want to look good. Maybe they want more energy. But people that are carrying that extra weight, especially year after year, what is that doing to the system? Right. Well, from this Again, this new perspective, it's not the weight per se that's the problem. It's what's happening metabolically in the fat cells. So um, it's been said, not just by me, by others, that weight gain is the price you pay for not getting diabetes on a bad diet. Let's just say that one more time. Weight gain is the price you pay for not getting diabetes on a bad diet. So that if you're eating the wrong foods, you know, they're, you know, you're getting these hormonal responses. These are, are unhealthy. That as long as your fat cells continue to sop up those extra calories and they can do so and store them safely, 
you're all right metabolically. You're not going to get diabetes. But fat cells will come to a tipping point sooner or later. For some people, it's at a relatively low BMI. That's why some people can have a almost just a mildly overweight body weight and um, and get diabetes, type 2 diabetes. Some people can be ma- have massive obesity and not. So fat cells can differ in how much calories they can sop up. That's the place that extra calories are meant to be safely stored. But sooner or later, many people come to a tipping point where those fat cells can no longer keep taking up the calories. They And they get too big and they start to get inflamed and white cells move in and they start releasing these uh, inflammatory mediators. And those calories that can't be safely stored in fat cells anymore get stored what's called ectopically. They get stored elsewhere in places that can't manage the fat safely. Number one, liver, so fatty liver. Number two is muscle. Um, Ectopic fat and muscle makes insulin resistance. And in the bloodstream, that's called triglycerides. And so um, it's not being fat per se, although, you know, for many people that's a cosmetic issue, but, you know, it's not the problem. It's the health of the fat cells. And we can, according to the carbohydrate and cell model, prevent this whole sequence of events from getting started by focusing on foods that lower insulin um, at an early stage of events. That's such an interesting way of looking at it. Like your fat is doing good for your health in the beginning till you push it and push it. And then the fat just can't take it anymore and says, I can't store any more of these calories. And that's when the real trouble starts. And we, we actually, there's a model for this, which is called lipodystrophy. It's well-recognized in medicine. Uh, relatively rare conditions, oftentimes with a genetic origin, where people can't, actually can't store any fat. You know, fat cells are not working. And so they're extremely lean, um, sometimes shockingly lean, because you know we're used to seeing people with fat in certain places that are attractive. And so these people are, are shockingly lean, um, but they have, they're not famished, like they're not looking like they're starving, like you might see a refugee in a detention, you know, in some war zone where they're losing muscle and fat. Um, these people have plenty of muscle. They just have a s- shocking lack of fat tissue. And, um, but that this is not a benefit to them. They are at extremely high risk of metabolic problems. They can get diabetes and heart disease um, in young adulthood, for exactly this reason, because in effect, their fat cells are not able to serve as that buffer to store the excess calories in a healthy way. And so those, you know, the, they, they build up in the bloodstream, they build up in places they shouldn't and cause all sorts of metabolic problems. When it comes to the buffering, how much of it is due to growth of fat cells versus making new fat cells? Yeah, that's a good question. It's I think it's both. Um, we do we do both. We can make new fat cells, but mainly I think that uh, it's uh, expansion of fat cells to um, a critical threshold. You know, you can you can pack um, only so much luggage into a suitcase before the seams start to rip. Coming back to our common thread, which is insulin, it gets me thinking about snacking. So somebody we've talked about now narrowing the eating window. We've talked about different foods that are going to have a different impact on blood sugar and insulin. Now let's talk within the eating window, the importance of having say three distinct meals versus having snacks in between and how that's going to, obviously if there's carbohydrates in those snacks, it's going to end up spiking blood glucose and insulin. But do we need to really factor that in once we make bigger changes with the diet and, and potentially narrow that eating window? Okay, so let's just step back for a sec, um, take a look at the big picture. So there are kind of two strategies, um, nibbling uh, versus gorging, you could say, um, although I don't mean gorging in a negative way here. Uh, if you nibble, uh, even a high-carb diet is going to have a lesser impact on, on, on insulin, you know. Many, and this is actually was a famous study in the New England Journal of Medicine, nibbling versus gorging. 
they took a kind of a traditional high carb diet and gave it to people either in a few meals, I think two or three meals, or 17 little snacks. So like basically in uh, eating a little something every hour of your waking time. And that showed a lot of benefits, that nibbling, because you're not slamming in, you're not having to go into the fast, into you know running out of calories and, and crashing. Um, so even a sugary beverage, if you literally just sipped it, um, would have much lesser metabolic impact. Um, that's one way to go if you want to eat 17 meals a day. If you want to eat fewer meals a day and then take advantage of some other benefits from fasting, then you, you got to go the lower carb route. You know, if you're eating a high carb diet, it's going to fight with that fasting. So that doesn't mean, you know, no carbs, but just you got to cut down. And then you can shorten the window um, and, you know, it kind of all lines up. You're not trying to push in one direction and pull in the other. Um, and as to whether, so for me, it's fine. I just, I have two meals. I just skip breakfast, have my coffee, um, black, strong, a low carb lunch, and then a big dinner with some carbohydrate. And that's all, that's fine. I'm not hungry. I'm fully satisfied. Um, but, you know, both in transitioning to that or as a maintenance, you know, people might differ based on their lifestyles, their culture. I mean, we have to think about food as much more than just fuel. You know, it's a, you know, we're, we, we want to adapt with our families, with our cultures. And so there's no one magic way. Um, and I, I, I would hope people, you know, don't get too obsessive about this. Hearing you talk about the way you eat in a typical day is very similar to me. I'm a coffee guy in the morning and and tend to have my biggest meal at dinner. Recently, I've come across a lot of the people I've been talking to, well, not a lot, but a handful of them that have been talking about the benefits of having that eating window where you're having breakfast and lunch and then skipping dinner, which brings about the point of insulin resistance being more prominent in the evening. And the reason I want to bring this in is because, again, the common thread here is is insulin. So people that want to be cognizant of how their body's responding to foods might want to consider that when they're determining when they're going to eat. It's certainly worth trying um, and and you know playing around and seeing how your body does. Um, there's an extreme version of this called OMAD, O M A D. I'm sure you've heard of it. One meal a day. So these are people who bring their eating window down to like one hour. They just have one meal. And some people can do that. If you're doing that, don't have your one meal at 9.30 at night. You know, just, <laughs> actually, I tried that once. <laughs> uh, I was just like, at three o'clock in the morning, I was just sweating, you know, just... <laughs> Well, that ties back um, to the sleep piece we talked about earlier. If you want yeah. to have a better sleep, you need to give yourself that three or four hours before bed after the last meal to digest yeah. so properly. So if you're if you're OMAD, which I'm not recommending uh, for the general public, you know you want to have that maybe at two o'clock. And you know, you know uh, some cultures where people just have one big meal, and you know they might have a snack or two. Uh, but also, let's just come back to the culture thing. Uh, for many people, having their big meal. Um, later in the day is going to be much more socially acceptable, you know, when your family, when your friends are also eating their big meal. Um, and uh, I, th I think as long as it's not like the Italians or Spanish do, you know, at 9.30 or 10 o'clock, you know, if you're having that meal at 6, 6.30, even 7, you know, you've still got three hours before you're going to bed and you're going to get through the peak of the digestive challenge. What would you say to vegans or vegetarians out there? Because inevitably, at least in a general sense, they're going to be having a lot more calories in the form of carbs, which again ties to the theme here. Have you seen people on those diets adopt something like this new paradigm that you're talking about today? Have you seen people on those diets adopt that successfully? One of the skirmish lines in the diet wars is between vegan, low fat, and carnivore, low carb, animal based, low carb. And um, 
this doesn't really need to be. It's an unnecessary skirmish. You can eat animal-based low fat, right? You know, with um, dry chicken breast, egg whites, and fat-reduced cheese. Yeah, that's all animal products, and that's going to be low fat. And then you're going to be getting your, you know, you'll get carbs elsewhere. Um, or you can eat vegan, um, high fat, low carb. There's even a community online, Facebook, with last time I checked, you know, thousands of people who are vegan keto, vegan keto. They have like a picture of a unicorn or something on there. Um, I think that 50,000 followers. And that I, I accept is that's a tough one. Um, because there's a lot of foods, you know, you have to, you're going to have to probably use some protein supplements and such. But, um, but if you just wanted to be low, low carb, like in the 25 to 40% range, that's eminently doable vegetarian or vegan. And um, that becomes more of a personal choice based on one's ethics, you know, environmental concerns. I think that, you know, these do cut both ways. I think there's no way anytime we eat, animals die. You know, whether that's um, if it's monocultured grains or soybeans and the soils being tilled, you know, the you're you're losing, you know, beginning with the worms and the, you know, they use pesticides, right? Because you don't want the mice to be eating the crops or the birds. So mice die, birds die. Um, you know, you displace deer, you know, there's death in eating wh whatever we do. We want to obviously aim for reducing harm and we want to, uh, you know, have a sustainable environment. And so there's, of course, debate as to what's the best way to do that, whether um, cows grazing on natural pastures that wouldn't be, um, uh, amenable to agriculture, or if you brought in agriculture, it would cause much more disruption. Whether you know whether that is sustainable, um, you know, probably is in a in a in a niche in areas. You know, uh, the other side, we don't have enough pasture so that increase like eight billion people can be eating steak three times a day. So you know, we have to we're going to have to struggle with these issues in many ways. But um, I think that the reflex vegan low fat and animal based low carb is an unnecessary battle which obscures much common ground throughout our conversation we've kind of teased out what a typical day might look like for you when you're eating what you're eating but let's go through a typical day in more detail here we know you start with coffee take us through what you might have for lunch well, I, I'm gonna, and dinner I'm gonna, no, just I'm to gonna... give just to give us a nice Overview I, idea. I think I think I'm gonna. Um, yeah, I, I think I've shared enough personally. Um, I've, I've given you the big idea, and what I'm in, more importantly trying to emphasize is not the idiosyncrasies of what I and my family do. I mean, uh, and I'll just emphasize that in our book, in Always Hungry, we have we certainly have plant based um, recipes, but we have vegetarian and vegan options for most recipes. So what we're trying to do is be inclusive and not um, just say that there's one way to do it. Um, uh, I think that it, it, by getting rid of the unnecessary skirmish lines, we hopefully can focus more on the facts. And I think the facts, which from whatever perspective you look at is the processed carbs and the added sugars are driving metabolic dysfunction. And that's what we've got to focus on, whether that be more plant-based or animal-based. Okay, fair enough. So we've talked about a lot of the different variables when it comes to weight loss, including sleep, stress. We went deep into food. Any other big ones that we forgot to talk about? I think that there, there's also going to be the macro level, you know, that we are, we as individuals have, of course, a lot of control over what we eat and we are ultimately responsible for ourselves. and that there's much that can be done on the environmental, economic, and political levels to make healthful choices easy, convenient, inexpensive, um, and tasty or not. And we've created a food supply that sort of makes the opposite, that the worst choices are the ones that are 
closest at hand and least expensive. This is the ultimate of penny wise pound foolish, you know. Um, for lack of proper investment in our food supply, we're facing an increasing epidemic uh, burden of human toll and economic catastrophic economic burden of diet related disease. We're raising a generation of children that the military says might be unfit to fight. You know, talk about national security, and our ultimate security is going to be threatened. You know, if we have a generation that's too sick to be productive workers. So we have to view diet-related disease as a, a national emergency. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of political dysfunction in this country. But hopefully we can all get together and agree, you know, that um, we have to work together to detoxify the environment. And I believe that there's a strong role for government. This didn't happen with the government is in up to its ears in food policies that have contributed to the current state of affairs. And so the notion that we should just let it all be free market capitalism, this isn't a free market. The government has influenced the market as it is. We want the, we need the government to play a role um, uh, uh, to rebalance the food supply in a way to create incentives so the food industry can um, focus, can compete to make healthy foods. Ultimately, the competition has been to the lowest common denominator to make the most processed, least healthful foods. The industry, food industry can make money with anything. They can make money selling bottled water. So they can make money selling healthful foods. We just have to uh, reverse the incentives that have uh, favored a junk food market. Do you feel like research like the stuff you and your team is doing and conversations like this are helping to move the conversation as a whole in a better direction when it comes to food? Uh, you know, progress is always slow on these big issues. Um, and uh, it's unfortunate that uh, the government spends just a fraction of a cent for, for every dollar that obesity-related diseases cost society. You know, we're desperately underfunding nutrition research. And as a consequence, and there's also in a bit of an entrenched mindset. We have many, many low, big low-fat diet trials, some of them costing hundreds of millions of dollars. And for the most part, they've all failed to produce any meaningful weight loss or reduction in uh, heart disease or diabetes or cancer. Uh, the government has yet to fund one low carb diet study of comparable magnitude and uh so this is both um an entrenched mindset um and uh i think um you know um the problems with underinvestment into research infrastructure you know my group at boston children's hospital in harvard is uh to some degree dependent upon philanthropy to do the most rigorous diet studies. Um, you know, the, the standard government limit for uh, a major grant is uh, 2.5 million. That hasn't changed in 30 years. Um, a really good diet study could cost 10 times that. And uh, so um, we're, always wel we're always welcoming uh, um, philanthropy from your uh, viewers um, if they're interested in advancing nutrition research. Dr. Ludwig, we've covered a lot today. I think it's important we go back and highlight the essence of our conversation, which is what we started with. The fact that we want to be more mindful of the processed carbohydrates, carbohydrates in general as well. That's going to lower blood glucose, help keep insulin lower, and that's going to keep our fat cells from taking in too many calories, starving the rest of the body, and causing this whole cycle that's, you know causing the obesity epidemic we're in today. Right. And it, not the only cause, but uh, if this model is right, and scientific models, I should say, for co complex diseases, they're, they're never right. Um, they're, they're wrong. But the, they, they may move us closer to a deeper understanding. You know, we've been doing the same thing for a century. You know, the original calorie in, calorie out, calorie counting approach to weight control started around 1920, 100 years ago. Um, Lulu Hunt Peters had the first modern era best-selling diet book. It was a 
you know, I wish uh, Always Hungry sold as well. And, um, you know, that was just divide everything up into 100 calorie portions, subtract 500 calorie blocks, and your weight will take care of itself. Um, it didn't work back then. The low fat diet based on reducing the most energy dense nutrient, you know, that first food guide pyramid, that didn't work. We have new iterations of this energy balance view. Maybe it'll work better, but at a certain point, when you keep trying the same approach and it isn't working, uh, we need new thinking. And I'm not saying that a low carb diet is the magic answer, but we need to start thinking about weight control more biologically. And the carbohydrate insulin model goes way beyond just carbohydrate. It's a model for understanding how all these factors we discussed, other aspects of the diet, stress, sleep, physical activity, could drive weight gain by actions at the fat cell. And that if we don't consider that, if, if this model is at least part correct, we're going to be struggling, like we're going to be looking through the wrong end of the telescope, uh, and we're not going to see the full picture. So that's why we need the research to clarify these models, um, build new models that are more rigorous, and then ultimately guide the most effective treatment. You know, we want weight loss to be maximum benefit for minimum effort. And for that to happen, we have to get the science right. Well, Dr. Ludwig, the work you and your team is doing is definitely moving the conversation of, of food and its position within weight loss forward. So thank you for that. Loved your book. We're going to link that up in the show notes. We're going to link up your social media, your website, everything. I want to thank you for coming on the show. Really enjoyed this. My pleasure. Now that you're done my conversation with Dr. Ludwig, you're going to want to stick around here and catch my chat with Jason. There's a lot more to learn when it comes to weight loss. You don't want to miss this. I'll see you over there. The thing about exercise is that it's, it's extremely good for you, but the weight loss...